everyone. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction, and uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Well, let's see. A few, I didn't hear anything on this. Let me try that again. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Okay. I think that's a warm Pensacola welcome. Thank you. Well, I am, uh, I am very, very pleased to, to, to be here, very pleased that Ken uh, invited me down to, uh, one, to visit the IHMC, which is an organization I'd heard a lot about, uh, the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. Uh, Cognition. See, my voice is leaving me. Um, but I've never had a chance to visit here, so this is really a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for me. Uh, I will tell you that I'm blown away. Uh, I get involved in a lot of technologies, a lot of technology-related uh, activities. Uh, I get a chance to see and interface with a lot of technical uh, scientists and engineers, but the things I saw this afternoon, just in a couple of hours, have stirred my interest, one, to come back, uh, but two, to look for a way, any way I can, uh, to help Ken and work with Ken and his people uh, to continue the great, great science that exists here. And for those who are in the community who perhaps uh, do not know everything that IHMC is involved in, uh, you're missing something. Uh, you're missing something in part because it's uh, world class uh, in one respect, but also because the kind of things they're doing will set the tone for new ways of supporting mankind in the future. And I think that's something we all should be uh, very, very interested in. Um, uh, you, you also find out a lot about people when you get a chance to, to come to an organization like this and spend some time. Uh, Ken mentioned that we both serve on NASA's advisory uh, council, and we both are part of that activity, uh, reporting to and serving the administrator of NASA, Dr. Mike Griffin. Uh, but uh, I'm always interested in finding out about people. I'm, I've always, through my Air Force career, had a reputation of being a people person more than anything else, even though I am an engineer. Um, I've always had a reputation for being a people person. And uh, finding out about people and their interests, uh, it's always something I think is very, very stimulating. And, and I'm not going to get into details here. Some, some of you probably know this, uh, but for those of you who don't, um, I just suggest you might want to Google, since we all do that today, uh, the name Lulu Coolis. Lulu Coolis. Now, I see I didn't get any reaction. Uh, there's a smile here. Uh, that's a female name, but I think you'd be very interested in finding out about that name uh, and the relationship between that name uh, and the founder and head of uh, IHMC. And I'm not going to say anything further. It's a very, very interesting story. It's a part of Ken you didn't, I didn't know exist, and you probably uh, didn't either, and, and I just suggest you might want to Google that. Let's see. Ken hasn't thrown me out yet, so I guess I'm safe in, the, in having mentioned that. Well, um, I, I told Ken that one thing I would not do, and I told he and his staff, what I would not do uh, this afternoon is close my eyes. Uh, I flew in to, um, uh, from, on a red-eye flight uh, from Los Angeles uh, last night, flew to Washington, D.C., back home, just in time to change bags, uh, change suitcases, if you will, immediately got on another airplane and then flew down here to Pensacola. And uh, so I had a full day in uh, California. I was a part of a uh, National Academy of Science uh, study uh, looking at research and development programs for what's called the Next Gen, Next Generation Air Transportation System. Uh, and we spent a full day at the University of California in Irvine reviewing technologies all day, research development technologies that relate to the next generation air transportation system for the year 2025, 2030 and beyond. Very, very interesting. Uh, but um, uh, when you think about doing that all day, then getting on an airplane and flying all night and then coming right here, if I close my, if I close my eyes, some of you will know it because I'm going to fall down here in the, <laughs> and fall asleep. Uh, Ken also told me about the way this is structured. There's a room full here, uh, which I'm very pleased to see. Uh, there are also some in the uh, uh, sort of fallout room, if you will, back in the, where the food is and, and the drinks are, who are also set up to, to watch this. Uh, the operative word is food and drink. Uh, I think they're watching us on, uh, uh, on screen. I think there's a large screen back there where they can watch this. And I'll be honest with you, if I had to watch me on screen, I'd be drinking and eating too, so... <laughs> So they're back there enjoying themselves, and hopefully uh, we'll get a chance to uh, uh, both interact and, and talk to a little bit about a subject that's of very, very strong interest to me. Before I do that, let me just mention very quickly about uh, uh, my past. I'm a native of Washington, D.C., born and raised in Washington, D.C. I'm a true native of Washington, D.C. 
a lot of times you talk to people and they say they're from Washington, D.C., and then you immediately ask them where they live, and they say nearby Maryland or Virginia. But I was born and raised in the city, um, went to high school in the city, an academic-related high school in the city. I turned on an appointment to the Air Force Academy and stayed locally and went to the historical black college there, Howard University. Uh, got an engineering degree, mechanical engineering, and then uh, through the Air Force ROTC program, immediately came into the Air Force, where my first assignment, as I found out in the uh, common ground and talking to one of the individuals, uh, one young lady as we were uh, walking in this evening, uh, went to New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, where the Air Force sent me to get a master's degree. Uh, it turns out it was a master's degree in mechanical and nuclear engineering. And then subsequent to that, I spent, uh, well, literally 35 years in the Air Force uh, doing various research and development, uh, engineering-related activities, uh, science and uh, logistics activity. Uh, very, very blessed throughout my, uh, uh, my entire uh, Air Force career. Since that time, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, I've been actively involved in technology areas in a wide variety of senses, from serving on corporate boards to doing some pro bono work for various agencies, uh, the NASA Advisory Council and, and other related things. Uh, I'm also a partner in a venture capital firm. Uh, but the way I describe it to everybody is I'm flunking retirement and uh, flunking it badly, too. And my wife accuses me of not learning in my Air Force career. It's a very simple word, a two-letter word. It begins with N, ends with O. And I have to learn how to use that word when asked to do things more so that uh, I can fit everything in that I, I try to do uh, and want to do. Uh, I've now added another thing to the list, and that's getting back to IHMC in Pensacola, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I make one little comment before I get into the meat of my, uh, my topic here, and that's uh, as I look around the room, I see a few senior people, uh, not, perhaps not as senior as me, but a few senior people here in the room, and uh, I will tell you, I loved my Air Force career. I loved all 35 and a half years I spent in the Air, Air Force. I loved wearing the uniform. I loved serving our country. I loved everything about it. I very proudly wore that uniform. And I would have the uniform on today if I had an opportunity to, but uh, the Air Force asked its uh, four stars, uh, four star generals, to retire at 35. It's, in part, it's to allow other people to matriculate through the system, if you will, and to not hold things up. But uh, as I look in the, out and see those of you who are retired, I think most of you know that one day something happens and you know it's time to retire. I, I, it's, it's a little signal, a little voice, or something. Uh, that tells you it's time to retire. And in my case, uh, it was not a little voice. It was a little voice, but it was a, uh, a very prominent uh, human voice. It was my five-year-old grandson uh, who gave me the signal that it was time to retire. It was the um, end of 2002, um, uh, excuse me, actually the beginning of 2003, and um, Martin Luther King's birthday, 15th of January in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I was in Ohio running the Air Force Material Command located in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, my son and his family, including my grandson, uh, Justin, were in the D.C. area. My son took my grandson down to Washington, D.C. to participate in some of the Martin Luther King Day celebrations. And while he was there, my son mentioned to his son, to my grandson, that he said, do you know that your grandfather was actually here that day, uh, August 28th, 1963, when Martin Luther King had his famous uh, Freedom March, he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Now, for those of you here counting now, uh, I was a young teenager at the time, but I was there as a native of Washington, D.C., and for some reason that struck my grandson as being uh, fascinating, that his grandfather was associated with something in history. So that evening he came back uh, to his uh, father's house, came back to his house, and uh, he called me up in Ohio, and he uh, wanted to talk to me. He said, you know, Grandpa... Uh, I was very, very surprised to hear that you were actually there when Martin Luther King uh, gave his I Have a Dream speech. And I was uh, uh, just very, very surprised and very happy to hear that. And uh, he talked some more about it. And I was surprised that a five-year-old at the time could relate to something historical like that and decided he wanted to call on his own. He wanted to call his grandfather. And so he said, uh, you know, Grandpa, we've been studying about Martin Luther King uh, in school. And we've also been studying about Ben Franklin. Were you there when Ben Franklin flew a Skype? <laughs> this, this is a true story. A true story. 
And so I realized at that moment, if your grandchildren think you date back to the colonial days, you are old and it's time to retire. And the next day I put in my papers and, uh, and left from there. Well, let me, let me talk a little bit about a subject that is of very strong uh, importance and interest to me. Um, when I had a chance uh, this afternoon uh, on a radio show to uh, talk to Marty Stanovich at 1620 AM News Radio, uh, he used the, um, uh, the acronym STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And uh, it's the er- an area that I think is of very strong importance to our country. It's important to our economy. It's important to national security. And it's an area where we have a major crisis in the United States. And I don't think people realize how much of a crisis we have and how important that subject is to, uh, to all of us. And so I want to talk a little bit about why it is a crisis, uh, talk about some facts associated with it, uh, talk a little bit about why it is of importance to me and why I really have jumped on this subject besides being an engineer and why uh, I've been talking about this subject in every uh, venue that I could have an opportunity to do so. And then talk about a couple of uh, things that can be done, should be done, uh, not just by the government, but by the public to try to address this crisis, uh, crisis area. And then I'll wrap up and hopefully we'll have time for uh, plenty of questions uh, from you. I don't know if I'll have any answers, but you have plenty of questions and I'll look forward to addressing your questions, whatever they might be. They don't have to be on that subject. Uh, they could be on almost anything that you want it to be. I'm more than willing to, uh, to try to address it. So let me begin by mentioning, uh, in late 2005, uh, by request from Congress, uh, the National Academies, that's the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine, uh, released a report that was titled, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, Energizing and Employing America for a Brighter Economic Future. Uh, That Gathering Storm report, uh, which which was put together by a group of people led by Norm Augustine, He's a former head of uh, CEO of Lockheed Martin uh, and very, very noted industrialist, speaker, etc. Uh, his report resulted in a unanimous congressional support and in part was the impetus for the American Competitiveness Initiative, a bill which was passed by both houses in Congress unanimously and signed by the president. Two years later, in 2007, last year, Norm Augustine getting a little bit concerned that not enough had been done to address the subject area, the recommendations coming out of the Gathering Storm report, published an essay. The essay was an update to the Gathering Storm study, and his essay was titled, Is America Falling Off the Flat Earth? And let me just capture a few of the relevant facts from both his essay and the original Gathering Storm report. Uh, Some of these, by the way, for those of you who listened to Marty Stanovich's uh, uh, news report today, heard some of these facts mentioned uh, by him and a couple by me. And I will tell you right now, it's not so much the accuracy of the numbers of some of the things that we're going to mention. It's the message that's there, if you will, that I think we all should be concerned about. And I say that because there are lots of studies out there. They may differ here and there on the exact numbers of some of these uh, Uh, some of these metrics, but that's not important. It's really the message of what is happening to the United States. Uh, The United States today now ranks about 24th, 25th, even in some surveys as much as 30th of of major countries and even some smaller countries in the world in science and math education. The United States ranks 17th amongst major nations in the rate of high school graduates and 14th in the world in the rate of college graduates. We today have more foreign students here in the United States who are involved in science, technology, engineering, and math programs at our universities than we have United States students, our own students, American students, who are in that same, uh, those same curriculums in universities, our universities. Today, China and India graduate more students in science, technology, engineering, and math, and I realize there's a numbers issue here, but still it's something to be concerned about. They graduate more students in science, technology, engineering, and math than the United States graduates students in all disciplines in all of our universities. Today, we have fewer than 18% of our U.S. students who are in high school and who are actually going to college will graduate even within six years, not four years, not five years, in six years. 18%, only 18% who go into college actually graduate in a six-year time period. 
Now, I could go on and on with these facts, and uh, they're almost numbly, 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 ooh, excuse me, they numb, they're very numbing, excuse me. <laughs> Told you I was sleepy, excuse me. Uh, they're boring to most Americans, but they shouldn't be because they're so important. And the question is for all of you, and even for me, and uh, for all of us who are involved in today, is why should we care? Well, let me just mention one dimension, the economic dimension as to why we should care. Uh, this year, uh, Business Week, late last year, and I think they've actually come out with the stats already this year, ranked the information technology companies, the best companies in the world in information technology. Only one in the top ten was an IT company based in the United States. The other nine were uh, from the rest of the world, including from Asia. Sixty percent of the patents which are filed in IT, information technology, originate in Asia. This is over the past year. 60% of patents came out of Asia, not the United States. And actually, the bulk of the rest of them came from other places besides the United States. Only one of 25 of the largest initial public offerings, IPOs, on the stock market last year was from a U.S. company. Uh, five years ago, it was just the reverse. Uh, 24 of 25 of IPOs came out of U.S. companies, and one came out of the rest of the world. Today, those numbers have switched ex completely. One out of 25 of the largest IPOs in the world um, was from a United States company. China today is now the world's number one high-technology exporter. And the United States ranked number one uh, in 2002 at 38%. Uh, in terms of being involved in world science and technology activity. Today, and certainly by 2020, we will rank uh, like number 17 behind China and actually behind most of the other Asian countries besides China. Let me give you a couple of daily examples in life as to what this really means for all of us in terms of economy, in terms of ways we get things done in our everyday lives. Uh, as most of you know, most service calls you make to a company to solve problems or to make reservations for that matter, whether it's an airline, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's for other things, most service calls go to a person who lives in Bangalore or even in Jamaica. There's an office building near the White House uh, uh, in downtown Washington, D.C., where when you walk into this beautiful, beautiful edifice, you're greeted by a very pleasant woman on a large screen uh, display uh, who handles reception duties. She, makes, she handles security. She tells you where to go, etc. Beautiful, beautiful facility. That lady resides in Pakistan. She's not there. She's in Pakistan. A couple of weeks ago, I was doing some consulting for a, uh, a large architectural firm in Kansas City. The uh, name of the company is HNTB, just as a, a matter of, of, of knowledge. And while I was there, I uh, talking to their uh, architects and engineers and talking about their planners, I found out that most United States architectural firms have their drawings produced, not in the United States, uh, not in some uh, of their own facilities. Most of their drawings for U.S. architectural firms are produced in Argentina. Would never believe that, and produced uh, in Argentina. Uh, and many of you know, for those who are particularly in health, uh, uh, the healthcare business, know that CAT scans uh, in many hospitals, not all, but in many hospitals, are routinely read by radiologists. But not radiologists here. They're routinely read by radiologists in Australia or, again, in Bangalore. And even uh, routine jobs, as some people like to call them, uh, when we first uh, start hearing about these kind of things, and even in the Gathering Storm report, uh, somebody made a comment that, well, uh, we may lose those kind of high-tech jobs to uh, outsourcing to other places around the world, uh, but there's at least opportunity for our young men and women uh, to work in a McDonald's. Well, that's no longer going to be the case either. Uh, McDonald's is not immune to this electronic IT revolution. Uh, they are experimenting with a central ordering system, a central facility, which happens today to reside in Colorado Springs, where your ordering, when you pull up to the window, won't be the person smiling there uh, asking for your order or the person talking over the phone asking for your, your order. Uh, it will be somebody in Colorado. McDonald's is experimenting with, experimenting with that today, but they're also looking for an overseas location for doing the same thing. Uh, those are the kinds of reasons economically why I say this is a crisis, a uh, crisis area for our country. Uh, most of you are familiar with the, uh, the book, The Earth is Flat, uh, written by Tom Friedman. 
uh, and a couple years ago was very, very popular, still is very, very popular, uh, still is on some bestseller lists, uh, and still is very, very relevant to this area. Uh, he pointed out in his book, Tom Friedman, that science, technology, engineering, and math, and math, he used the acronym STEM, are the keys to innovation and power in today's world. He gave an example I think is very, very relevant, certainly to me, perhaps to many of you. Uh, many of us, I certainly remember uh, my parents when I was growing up in Washington, D.C. If I didn't finish my dinner, my parents would make a comment about, just think of all those poor, starving kids in China or some other place who would, use, uh, would love to have the food that you left on your plate. Well, Tom Friedman is now using a different paraphrase of that. Uh, he's telling your kids, uh, his kids, by the way, uh, that when they don't finish their homework, to think about those poor kids in India and China who are not starving for food, they're starving for your jobs, and they're going to get it because you're not finishing your homework. It's a different way of thinking about things. Lester Thoreau, uh, the noted uh, economist, uh, 20 years ago uh, pointed out that educational skills of the workforce will end up being the dominant competitive wor uh, weapon for America, uh, and particularly technical skills. Well, the way we're going today, they're going to end up being a competitive uh, weapon, if you will, uh, for our adversaries. And the adversaries can be friendly today, but they may not be always very friendly, particularly in an economic sort of warfare environment. Well, my motivation for this topic, let me just mention just a couple of things. Uh, um, Ken mentioned uh, the President's Space Commission. In 2004, I was asked by President Bush uh, to serve on what was called the President's Space Commission. Uh, the formal title was to a commission to look at an implementation strategy for the new United States policy of going back to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Uh, we called it euphemistically uh, the President's Space Commission. On that commission included, uh, at that time, uh, the CEO of Hewlett Packard, Carly Fiorina. Uh, it also included uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, some of you may, if you get newspapers and you have a parade magazine, uh, you saw him on the front cover a couple of months ago. He's the head of the Hayden Planetarium in, uh, uh, in New York City, uh, a noted uh, uh, astrophysicist, and now he's the new NOVA head, the NOVA TV show. Occasionally when they bring that back, he's the guy who uh, narrates that particular show. So uh, Carly, uh, Neil, myself, and uh, uh, several others, and uh, we were part of the President's Space Commission. And when we talked to President Bush about what he was expecting out of this Space Commission, it turns out that notwithstanding the formal task of developing a new implementation strategy, what he really was trying to do was to find another way to stimulate interest in science and math in young people and even not so young people in the United States. He wanted another Apollo sort of a, a conundrum, if you will, where, as we all know, in the Apollo program, it really jump-started interest in science and math. It certainly did for me when I was in high school and in college. And he was looking for another way to try to do that uh, uh, through this new um, space policy for the United States. Now, it didn't quite turn out the way the president mentioned, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. I've also been part of a National Science uh, Academy of Science uh, study on engineering, uh, systems engineering. We just published a, a major report and uh, uh, briefed that uh, throughout the Washington, D.C. area to Congress and to others. Uh, that study has as one of its major conclusions that the United States is failing in educating our young people uh, to be the workforce for science and technology, engineering and math activities uh, in, the, in the future. And then uh, today I'm serving on another uh, commission, uh, Space Commission. This one is looking at how the United States should organize for all of its space activities between classified space programs and uh, unclassified space programs. And our number one, number one recommendation, number one issue is that we have lost the bubble in terms of educating young people to even know and understand or, or appreciate science, technology, engineering, and math. And we're not going to be able to do the things we want to do in our country in the future as a result of that. Um, Ken also mentioned that I uh, served as a director of the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. It's the Missile Defense Agency, as we call it today. Uh, all of us were very, very proud uh, a few weeks ago when we shot down one of our own satellites, which was hurtling back towards, uh, uh, hurtling back towards Earth. And it proved that the missile defense capabilities really, uh, uh, really do work. Uh, but 
the underlying premise for that is that we have people who know how to work on those programs, who have an interest in those programs for the future. And that's an issue that we think is, is lacking. And then finally, I had the opportunity to uh, advise, I guess is the right term, a couple of the presidential candidates to talk about various areas of national security. And in doing so, uh, I point out to one key thing to each of them that I've had a chance to talk to. is that national security does not mean just the military. It doesn't mean just warfare. National security is broad. It includes diplomacy. It includes information. It includes the military. But it also includes economics. And the underpinning for the economics is to have a very strong, robust science, technology, engineering uh, sort of basis in our country so we can develop new capabilities and don't have to depend on other countries to provide them for us. I was struck uh, along the area of national security uh, by a study uh, I read about uh, not too long ago. The title of it was Adapt, Adapt or Die, the U.S. military's responsibility to protect America by leading the transformation in science and technology. The authors of that, uh, that study were a U.S. Navy captain, uh, Ron Weisbrook, but his co-author was uh, Newt Gingrich. And Newt pointed out to particularly that it is essential for American national security that the U.S. continue to be on the leading edge of innovative thinking and scientific break breakthroughs. It is imperative that our nation's military officers appreciate that amongst everything else they appreciate in terms of warfare and understand what it means for the future of the United States and our national security. And it's that sort of message that, uh, that I've carried to uh, the candidates that I've had a chance to advise uh, uh, and to talk to. Now, when you think about those things, I've talked about some, some different facts, and I've only just sort of scratched the surface, if you will. As I stated, I could go on and on uh, all night and talking about some of, the, uh, some of the demographics and some of the metrics. But the, the real question is, what do we do about it? What's the, what can we do about it? I think uh, Newt Gingrich uh, and also the Norm Augustine Gathering Storm Report had some key elements there that I think are the right kind of things that are important. The first and foremost, and this was at the top of the list for Newt Gingrich, was awareness. Awareness by national security leaders in the case of Newt Gingrich, uh, and in my mind, awareness by the public when it comes down to really understanding what's going on out there, understanding its importance, understanding the relevance of it, understanding the impact to our economy and the impact to national security. And so every opportunity I have to talk about this subject, I try to spread the word as much as I can to hopefully make people more aware that this is really a crisis situation that our, our country is involved in. And we really need to, to be able to understand it. Uh, the, the second recommendation that came out of the uh, Gathering Storm Report and also out of Newt Gingrich is to try to think through the implications. Think about if we don't do anything, if we just continue the way we are, and we let uh, science and technology, engineering and math education in our school systems continue to wither or not improve because they've already withered and don't do anything about it. Think about the implications. I think you can already sort of surmise what the outcome might be uh, given some of the examples I mentioned and given the dependence that we will face on other countries uh, for essentially most of the things in our economy. We'll be left being nothing but a service economy, if you will, and a service economy that once you take away the McDonald's and what they can do, not, it's not going to have a lot to offer, if you will. Uh, we need to stay abreast, all of us, of uh, new knowledge and technology when we can. Now, uh, I'm sure uh, there are a lot of people saying, well, uh, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I'm an old dog, and I tell you, uh, I relish every time I learn something new every day. Uh, sometimes I learn it from my grandkids. Uh, but I still relish learning things, and you don't have to learn about the nuts and bolts. You don't have to be a physicist. You don't have to have a Ph.D. to learn about new technology and its implications and to appreciate it and understand what it could mean if that technology emanated from the United States as opposed to uh, some other area. And then probably the number one recommendation of everybody, everybody who's look at this, looked at this subject is we need to do something about the K-12 education system in our country. Um, it's, it's a few smothering. I think we have some volunteers to go back to K-12. through But we need to do something about it because uh, it's suffering today. Um, uh, 
Dr. Ken Ford and I were talking earlier, if you look at almost any study uh, about education standards between the United States and other countries, at the beginning of school, from the time somebody gets a K through maybe about the fourth grade, you find out that United States kids are just as good, if not better, than kids throughout the rest of the world. I mean, we're equal to, or sometimes, in some cases, in math and those kind of things, better. But something happens after about the fourth grade. It's like we fall off the cliff. And starting uh, in high school and in college, we end up ranking uh, anywhere from 20th to 15th, uh, certainly far out of the top 10, uh, uh, scoring well on engineering or math scores uh, or science scores of all the, the countries in the world, including some countries we would not expect to see that kind of result. And so we need to figure out something, all of us, to do something about uh, K-12 through education. And this is not disparaging teachers. Uh, I think teachers are unsung heroes, if you ask me. They don't get paid enough. Uh, they work very hard. They're trying their very, very best. But something needs to be done to help them uh, to teach uh, the kind of things that would stimulate interest in uh, science and math and technical things in uh, our programs. I was very interested in talking to uh, uh, Ken today and learning about uh, some of the programs that you uh, he has here at, um, at IHMC, the Science Saturday programs uh, and the I Love Science programs. Uh, whenever I hear about programs like that, I just uh, immediately beam first. And then I get a little depressed, and I'll tell you why. Because I've seen programs like that throughout the country. The good thing is like uh, the proverbial thousand points of light. Uh, everywhere I've looked in different communities, different companies, different organizations, there are programs like that that are going on trying to attack the problem in a, sp in a specific community or to do something in a specific community. And that, to me, is fantastic. But think about it. Think of what we, if we could focus those thousand points of light into something like a laser beam where we could really, really make an impact. And uh, to me, that's where leadership comes in, and leadership from the very, very top. Uh, I mentioned, uh, somebody told me uh, coming in today, uh, hit them hard in my comments, and don't be afraid about mentioning anything. I, so I will uh, make one comment. Yeah, let them rip is what, what he said. There's a gentleman back there, so if, if I offend anybody, attack him. Don't attack me. Uh, the one fault I had, and I've actually mentioned this uh, previously to the actual individual, the one fault I had with President Bush uh, and the Moon Program, the new U.S. space policy, uh, great, great initiative to try to use that to re-stimulate interest in science and math. But it's almost like everything else that our politicians do nowadays, it was a spike of interest. Uh, there was a major event uh, at NASA to announce it, and then after that, nothing was said at all. And what ends up happening in the policy in the United States, particularly in Washington, D.C., the individuals who end up controlling what happens in those programs is the Office of Management and Budget. And they will slice and dice and cut things to their heart's content. And we need leadership from the very top, not only to say we're going to do something, but to keep the emphasis on it. And to tell OMB, as an example, you need to fund these kind of things and don't just leave it up to their whim as to whether or not they're going to try to fund it. So those rays of light, like Science Saturday, like I Love Science, uh, that Ken is doing are fantastic. Uh, I'm hoping that sometime, eventually, we'll have some strong leadership uh, to pull together all these rays of light into a razor-like focus where we can really make an impact and make it uh, throughout the country in these very critical K-12 through programs in our country. Well, um, I want to give some time, leave time for... Um, for your questions and, and your, your comments, I'm also very concerned about the guys in the other room where they've left any wine or food left for us. So <laughs> I'm going to wrap up here just, uh, just shortly. But um, Dr. Carl Court, he's the CEO of uh, Battelle Memorial Institute. It's in Columbus, Ohio, a major research and development organization. Uh, they actually manage most of the Department of Energy's uh, nuclear uh, laboratories, national laboratories around the, uh, um, uh, around the country. Uh, I actually happen to serve on the Battelle board, so uh, very much interested in uh, what they're doing in the area of science and technology. I want to mention two things. One, uh, what they're doing similar to the kind of program that uh, Ken has here with uh, Science Saturday. And then I want to mention a quote from, uh, uh, from Carl Court. Uh, recently, Battelle got a, a grant, a matching grant. Actually, I shouldn't say matching, a huge grant uh, from the Gates Foundation. 
uh, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation found out about a school, a magnet school in Columbus, Ohio, uh, that Battelle has sponsored to stimulate interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. That school is doing fantastically. It's called the Metro School. Bill Gates found out about it, uh, visited it, uh, did a ribbon cutting there uh, last year, and was so impressed that he wants to use that school as a model for other similar science, technology, engineering, and math uh, schools, magnet schools in the state of Ohio. And if it really catches on there, try to spread that same model around the, around the country. And it doesn't hurt when you have now the number two richest guy in the, uh, in the world or in the country, uh, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, helping to do these kind of things. That's leadership of a different type. It's financial leadership, but it's substantial financial leadership. And hopefully that's going to carry a long way to try to help bring a better K-12 program in some of our school systems, at least in the state of Ohio. Hopefully it will grow, uh, grow elsewhere. Uh, Don Court, excuse me, Carl Court, uh, the uh, head of Battelle, made a comment that I think is very, very relevant. He said, science and technology can no longer be a spectator sport for most Americans, which is what I think all of us do. We, we read, or you see occasionally on 2020 or on TV or on 60 Minutes, uh, none of the things I've said tonight are a surprise. Uh, you've heard about it or seen about it, you've said about it in, in USA Today, in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, whatever it might be. Uh, but to most of us, it's been a spectator sport. We notice it, but we don't do anything. And now we need to become participants and getting there and get engaged to try to do something to solve these considerable problems, what I consider to be a crisis, uh, and a crisis to our economy and a crisis to our national security. So I hope uh, one of the things I've done tonight is to at least uh, increase your awareness of the subject. Uh, you've allowed me to share one of my passions, if you will. So uh, for those uh, perhaps uh, uh, that I did not quite uh, impassion like me, I, I owe all my apologies to you for that. But I hope it did grab enough of you that uh, you will have an opportunity to try to do something, whether it's through uh, politicians, through elections, through school systems. Uh, to me, this is a, uh, the number one issue for the future of America. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. There's a question back there. Somebody. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, I have been a judge at uh, the science fair, and there has been a continual decrease in the number of people that are actually uh, submitting any sort of a project. Um, I have a general question for you that goes along is that somewhat of my with this. Or is that just a <laughs> Well, I have to ask four questions for that general. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway. I told you I was sleepy. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. it's a four-star question. Uh, anyway, um, why should anybody that is in school now major in science if there are no jobs? that are going to be available for them because they've all been outsourced and, uh, you know. Uh, well, that's a good question. And uh, let me answer that two ways. First, uh, your comment about major in, uh, uh, in science. And, and I don't, I'm not presumptuous enough uh, or egotistical enough to say that everybody needs to, or future generation, to major in science or engineering or math. Uh, it's the awareness and understanding of them that I think is, uh, is, is really the key. Uh, to be able to work in those technical jobs and have an appreciation for those technical jobs. Uh, but I think the relevant answer to your question is, um, if we want to stave off losing more jobs uh, to uh, outsourcing or m losing more opportunities, we need to uh, get to the point where the innovation, which used to be the hallmark of the United States is back being our hallmark again. The jobs will come uh, or they will grow if we can stimulate the kind of innovation, the kind of innovation I saw here, by the way, even in a couple hours at IHMC. If we can stimulate that kind of interest and stimulate and support um, the, the kind of interest in uh, new technologies and new ideas and solving problems, the jobs will, will come, believe me. I understand that one of the uh, 
mandates uh, for this organization, IH, IHMC, is economic development. Uh, it's to spread education and help science and technology, but also economic development. And in other organizations that I'm associated with where there's a linkage between technology and uh, uh, economic development, the key is to grow the innovation, grow those things that can become uh, the kind of products you want to have marketed and grow the kind of jobs you want to have grown here in the United States as opposed to having them done overseas. So to me, whether you major in uh, science engineering or have an for, appreciation for it, is to really get back to the innovation that's been the roots of the United States. Yeah, there's a question back there. Doris, I think it is. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Doris Munoz, and I'm on the board of the African American Heritage Society. I'm a retired federal executive, and I worked for 25 years in the Department of Defense. However, I was, uh, you know, a very different person for defense, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the humanities. Why ha hasn't some of our genius gone into marrying STEM, as you say, with the humanities? And I'm sure there are ways to do that. I don't have the answer, and I'm in my, the fall of my years. I just wish I had about 25 or 30 more years. Uh, I was a language person, and I understand that's a very analytical skill. I didn't learn that until I was an adult. But you see, if children were trained in a way to put those things together, and if we think of our great musicians and our great artists, uh, you think of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, he was not only an artist, but he did some very innovative things in technology. So I think we tend to ex be exclusive and say, you know, you have to be this or you have to be that, instead of trying to marry it. Now, one of the things that we have to get over first, I feel, and maybe you could address this, is the situation in education today. If we look, I recently read a report about the state of Florida and the marks that were received in basic fields, English, math, history, science, and these, I mean, it, they, were, they had gone down since 2002. So we have got to start at the rudimentary level in a simplistic way. And maybe all of our teachers need retraining. I don't know what the answer is. But I would be for marrying the humanities with the sciences. Uh, Doris, I don't disagree with you at all. I think uh, uh, more and more people are beginning to realize that that sort of marriage, if you will, uh, has uh, tremendous, tremendous benefits. Uh, this metro school I mentioned in Columbus, Ohio, is, is trying to, to, to do that, uh, to bring them together. But uh, let me give you one example that uh, Ken Ford and I talked about. If you get there, uh, it's just a... Uh, uh, is it a monthly publication, Ken? Or? Quarterly. It's quarterly. Uh, the most recent co uh, copy uh, had, well, I guess you have it. So it's on page, uh, anyway. It talks about future talent. Uh, and if you look at the pictures of the four individuals there at the top, uh, the one guy with the beret playing a guitar is a close friend of Ken's, and he's a very close friend of mine. His name is Jeff Baxter. Uh, Skunk is his nickname. And for those of you who either have read or heard about him, uh, he is the original guitarist for the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan, uh, the rock group. Uh, he lives in Beverly Hills. He, like I say, he's a close friend of mine. Uh, what I have found, what Ken has found, is that, uh, and other, other organizations that are working with Skunk Baxter, who is an, an advisor to the CIA, he's advisor to organizations in the Air Force and to NASA and to the Secretary of Defense, is, uh, as Doris was mentioning about analytical skills, his music composition skills uh, allow him to think about problems in a different way. Uh, Ken has seen it here at IHMC where uh, Skunk supports some of the activities. I've seen it in everything I've involved Skunk Baxter in. He looks at problems and analyzes problems from a different perspective than us old died in the wool stead engineers or scientists, if you will, and he always brings a fresh perspective. He may not understand all the bits and bytes, uh, the details, but he allows us to think about those details in a different way. And it's doing exactly what you said. It's bringing the analytical skills of some of the humanities uh, coupled with the sciences. 
uh, this is a specific point in example, but I think we're seeing more and more of those, uh, those type of things. So I'm agreeing with you wholeheartedly. We need to do that. Uh, let's, well, we'll, let me get over here since we, and then we'll go. And there was somebody back there too. Uh, have you ever thought about a more fundamental thing, the family, motivation of children? Family structures is deteriorating, is a primary cause. You know, we say teachers, we say this, more money, but what about the family? Well, the family is, is uh, obviously ultimately uh, important. It is uh, probably the, the number one issue uh, that needs to be uh, addressed in so many of the different social structures. Uh, and the family is very, very important. I, I certainly don't mean to take away from that. Uh, I have found, though, in, in my experience, is that uh, when you stimulate young kids uh, to, to do things, and it could be sports, it could be the humanities, it could be the technical things, math, et cetera, uh, that if you, if you can do that in a proper way, if you have teachers who also can support them in school, they certainly cannot replace the family, but they certainly can allow a kid who otherwise may be on a path to something not so good to at least stay on a straight and narrow to something that can be very, very positive. And, and I've seen situations where kids uh, actually end up, uh, uh, if you will, sort of raising the family to their standards uh, because they brought back home a different way of looking at things than perhaps what the neighborhood uh, they're in sort of forces them to do. So it, it is important, uh, but hopefully you can help. You certainly can't replace it, but you can help in some respects by some of these other things. Let's see, it's a question over here, and then I think there was one back on the side. Excuse me. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for your remarks. I really appreciate them. Uh, from education's point of view, and that's not my question, but I really think we need to, we're still teaching the way we did 100 years ago, and we just can't do that. That's, that's why it costs so much. That's why it's, we get the results we get. Uh, I do have a couple of practical questions. I read that uh, the, uh, the, the space shuttle program will start to shut down in about three years and take about 10,000 jobs out of Florida as part of that. And since you were involved in some of our future space planning, I wonder what, uh, what, what uh, you could tell us about what might, uh, we might be able to do here regarding that. And uh, the, uh, the other thing, again, practically about here as, a, as an Air Force uh, general, uh, there's a controversy right now about uh, uh, the new Air Force uh, tanker contract, whether it goes to a British, uh, French uh, group or a, or a U.S.-based group, and uh, this, this area is sort of caught up in the middle of it because we would benefit from the European uh, group. Any I know I was going to get the tanker question here. Before that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, let me talk about NASA first. Uh, you know, when the, the president's space policy, new space policy came out, uh, the idea of retiring the shuttle uh, was done for a very practical reason. It's economic. The shuttle is extremely, extremely expensive to, uh, uh, to operate, uh, to prepare for launches, et cetera. I think most of you know that. And so the idea of retiring the shuttle and replacing it with something that uh, uh, was a little bit more efficient, more modern, uh, and I put quotation marks around that. I'll tell you why in a second, uh, et cetera, uh, was the right idea. Uh, my slight concern uh, is timing. Uh, the mandate by law, by the new policy, is we will retire the shuttle in 2010. Uh, unfortunately, the replacement <clears throat> program right now is not going to be ready until around 2015. So we have about five years there where the United States won't have uh, indigenous capability of sending astronauts to the International Space Station, etc. We're going to have to either rely on um, uh, foreign launches, uh, the French, uh, the Russians, I doubt the Chinese, but uh, who knows. Uh, but certainly the French and the Russian, we have to rely on them. But we're also developing through NASA a commercial capability not to take men uh, and women to the International Space Station, but to take supplies. Uh, it will be uh, it will rendezvous, et cetera. And that will be a U.S. capability that uh, hopefully we'll have available to get us there. But not if we want man presence for that five-year gap, we're going to have to rely on somebody else to do that. So... The, the timing was off. Uh, this is the proverbial getting off one horse in midstream before the other horse is there. So uh, we're going to have to do something about it. Now, I will tell you, even though we're going to retire the shuttle in 2010 and the costs in the budget are not there to continue flying the shuttle in 2010, uh, that may be revisited with a new administration. We, we don't know. Uh, 
the tanker question. First off, um, I will tell you, because I was involved in just minor portions of it, uh, the, um, the current tankers, the KC-135s, which are, some of them are 50 years old, uh, are falling apart. They haven't fallen apart in midair, thank goodness, because we do a good job of maintaining them, but we needed to replace the tankers. That, that's a given. And the competition that uh, the Air Force held was done rigorously. Uh, and I say rigorously, and it had everybody and his brother, from the GAO uh, to uh, other congressional groups, looking over the shoulder to make sure it was done fair and that it wasn't just a slam dunk for, uh, for one company, for Boeing, to be honest with you. So it was done very fair. Uh, the requirements are well stated for everybody to understand. There is a process in our source selection process in the Air Force for uh, a company. Uh, if they have a concern about a requirement, they think it's partial uh, to the other guy, as an example, there's an ombudsman process they have so they can raise those concerns. No concerns were raised. Uh, and again, it was a rigorous competition, uh, but I will tell you, in terms of the requirements uh, and the two uh, competitors, um, the one that was selected beat the other one in almost every category, in almost every category. So to me, the right team was chosen in terms of meeting the requirements. Unfortunately, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, uh, because particularly in this community here uh, in Mobile and uh, close by Alabama, will benefit from this to some extent, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we are not allowed in the federal government, uh, the Air Force, NASA, or anybody, we're not allowed job creation to be part of the source selection criteria. That's never been something the federal regulations will not allow us to do that. And uh, the lady, the young lady, uh, Sue Payton, who's the acquisition executive for the United States Air Force, told Congress, what do you want me to do, break the law? The law says I can't make job creation uh, part of my criteria for selecting, selecting somebody. And because that was not part of the criteria, they chose on all the other requirements. And uh, Northrop Grumman, with the EADS Airbus, uh, um, Airbus 330, were the, uh, was, was the winner. Now... Uh, there's, you know, facts, I always believe in people looking at facts before they make comments. Uh, one is going to be assembled in, uh, in Alabama. The airframes can be assembled. Lots of the parts and pieces and major systems will come from U.S. companies. On the other end, the other competitor, lots of their parts are going to be foreign made. That part didn't come out. Uh, and so uh, I think, the, uh, I think it, again, in terms of a fair competition, uh, the process was done properly. Beg your pardon? Well, uh, yes, in terms of fairness. Now, who knows? Uh, politics get involved sometimes when you have protests. So I, I can't tell you what the final outcome will be. But in terms of legality and fairness and the way the process was done, uh, the Air Force uh, uh, did that literally as fair as it could possibly be and as open as it could possibly be. We have time for one more question. <coughs> okay. okay. May I ask? Yes, you can. Anyway, it's my Navy friend here. Uh, the Norm Augustine and Newt Gingrich have done a great deal of study in these areas. And they've really come forward uh, with a, uh, essays uh, that have said we have a serious problem. What did they say about revitalizing the interest in science, technology, engineering, and math to, so that we can once again move ahead in the world and assume a major position and take a lead. Okay. Well, uh, they said uh, for the next generation, it's a subject we talked about earlier, of uh, the K-12 through school systems. Uh, it's the number one area to focus attention on uh, because uh, we need to catch young people, uh, get them interested and keep them interested for uh, throughout that entire period. That's uh, for the future generation. For today, uh, it really is the awareness thing uh, to make sure people are aware of um, uh, both the benefits of technology and how much we depend uh, on technology. I'll give you an example of that. When I served on the, uh, the President's Space Commission, one of our tasks was to go around the, the country and to hold uh, town hall meetings, if you will, in different communities to talk about the public interest uh, in space, in the future of space, and going back to the moon and Mars uh, and possibly beyond. 
Uh, it happened, this is a true story, in more than one place, we'd run into somebody who would come either testify to us or in the open forum uh, come to the mic and say, why should the United States spend billions and billions of dollars uh, on these space programs? I have my direct TV and my GPS in my car. What do I need space for? Well, that's the bit. <laughs> that's technology. <laughs> we do so many things that we take for granted that all have their roots in technology. And most of them today are roots in technology that animated uh, from the uh, innovations in the United States. In the future, if we don't do something about it, it will be technology will benefit, but it will be technology from some other place. So awareness was the other big thing. On that note, let's thank our speaker. Ken, can I, can I take the speaker's prerogative to get one more question? There's a young lady who had a okay. question over here, and I missed her twice. I apologize. Thank you. Um, during my time as a teacher, I taught at um, a learning center that is not part of the school system. Uh, we worked with students K through 12, and we found that parents, um, after about third grade, during that fourth grade critical time, were not equipped to answer the questions that their children came home with, and that it, that is part of the drop-off period there. Is there a program in place or a resource that parents can go to that is user-friendly for both parents and their students um, to help them with the STEM projects, especially for parents who themselves were not proficient in STEM projects? Wow, that's a good question. In all honesty, I've never heard of a program like that. I, uh, and that's an excellent, excellent idea. Uh, as I look around and, and work in various areas, like in the Columbus, Ohio, with that, uh, uh, the Metro School, uh, let me postulate that to people to start thinking about how we do that, because you're right. We're focusing on the teachers. Teach the teacher programs, and, and that's excellent. Uh, but you're right, the kids eventually have to, have to come home. And uh, uh, I will tell you, even though I'm an engineer, uh, when my, my kids, particularly my twin daughters, my two youngest ones, uh, too young, they're now 26, uh, when, they, uh, when they came home with the new math, et cetera, I thought I knew all about it, but I couldn't help them very, very much. To, so that's an excellent uh, point, and that, I don't think anybody's ever raised that before. Let me, uh, uh, let me try to spread the word and... To get people thinking about how we do that. I don't know. That's a good, good comment. Thank you. And since I failed to answer that, I need to get off the stage. <laughs> suitcases, if you will, immediately got on another airplane and then flew down here to Pensacola. And uh, so I had a full day in uh, California. I was a part of a uh, National Academy of Science uh, study uh, looking at research and development programs for what's called the next gen. Next Generation Air Transportation System. Uh, and we spent a full day at the University of California in Irvine reviewing technologies all day, research development technologies that relate to the Next Generation Air Transportation System for the year 2025, 2030, and beyond. Very, very interesting. Uh, but um, um, when you think about doing that all day, then getting on an airplane and flying all night, and then coming right here, if I, close my, if I close my eyes, some of you will know it because I'm going to fall down here and, uh, and fall asleep. Uh, Ken also told me about the way this is structured. There's a room full here, uh, which I'm very pleased to see. Uh, there are also some in the uh, uh, sort of fallout room, if you will, back in the, where the food is and, and the drinks are, who are also set up to, to watch this. Uh, the operative word is food and drink. Uh, I think they're watching us on... Uh, uh, on screen. I think there's a large screen back there where they can watch this. And I'll be honest with you, if I had to watch me on screen, I'd be drinking and eating too. So, <laughs> so they're back there enjoying themselves and hopefully uh, we'll get a chance to uh, uh, both interact and, and talk to a little bit about a subject that's of very, very strong interest to me. Before I do that, let me just mention very quickly about uh, uh, my past. I'm a native of Washington, D.C., born and raised in Washington, D.C. I'm a true native of Washington, D.C., a lot of times you talk to people and they say they're from Washington, D.C., and then you immediately ask them where they live, and they say nearby Maryland or Virginia. But I was born and raised in the city, um, went to high school in the city, an academic-related high school in the city. I turned on an appointment to the Air Force Academy and stayed locally and went to the historical black college there, Howard University. Um, got an engineering degree, mechanical engineering, and then uh, through the Air Force ROTC program, immediately came into the Air Force, where my first assignment, as I found out in the uh, common ground in 
talking to one of the individuals, uh, one young lady as we were uh, walking in this evening, uh, went to New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, where the Air Force sent me to get a master's degree. Uh, it turns out it was a master's degree in mechanical and nuclear engineering. And then subsequent to that, I spent, uh, well, literally 35 years in the Air Force uh, doing various research and development, uh, engineering-related activities, uh, science and uh, logistics activity. Uh, very, very blessed throughout my, uh, uh, my entire uh, Air Force career. Since that time, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, I've been actively involved in technology areas in a wide variety of senses, from serving on corporate boards to doing some pro bono work for various agencies, uh, the NASA Advisory Council and, and other related things. Uh, I'm also a partner in a venture capital firm. Uh, but the way I describe it to everybody is I'm flunking retirement and uh, flunking it badly, too. And my wife accuses me of not learning in my Air Force career. It's a very simple word, a two-letter word. It begins with N, ends with O. And I have to learn how to use that word when asked to do things more so that uh, I can fit everything in that I, I try to do uh, and want to do. Uh, I've now added another thing to the list, and that's getting back to IHMC in Pensacola, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I make one little comment before I get into the meat of my, uh, my topic here, and that's uh, as I look around the room, I see a Ken, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction, and uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Let's see, a few, I didn't hear anything on this, so let me try that again. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Okay, I think that's a warm Pensacola welcome. Thank you. Well, I am, uh, I am very, very pleased uh, to, to be here, very pleased that Ken uh, invited me down to, uh, one, to visit the IHMC, which is an organization I'd heard a lot about. Uh, the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, uh, Cognition. see my voice is leaving me, uh, but I've never had a chance to visit here, so this is really a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for me. Uh, I will tell you that I'm blown away. Uh, I get involved in a lot of technologies, a lot of technology-related uh, activities. Uh, I get a chance to see and interface with a lot of technical uh, scientists and engineers, but the things I saw this afternoon, just in a couple of hours, have stirred my interest, one, to come back, uh, but two, to look for a way, any way I can, uh, to help Ken and work with Ken and his people uh, to continue the great, great science that exists here. And for those who are in the community who perhaps uh, do not know everything that IHMC is involved in, uh, you're missing something. Uh, you're missing something in part because it's uh, world class uh, in one respect, but also because the kind of things they're doing will set the tone for new ways of supporting mankind in the future. And I think that's something we all should be uh, very, very interested in. Um, uh, you, you also find out a lot about people when you get a chance to, to come to an organization like this and spend some time. Uh, Ken mentioned that we both serve on NASA's advisory uh, council, and we both are part of that activity, uh, reporting to and serving the administrator of NASA, Dr. Mike Griffin. Uh, but uh, I'm always interested in finding out about people. I'm, I've always, through my Air Force career, had a reputation of being a people person more than anything else, even though I am an engineer. Um, I've always had a reputation for being a people person. And uh, finding out about people and their interests, uh, it's always something I think is very, very stimulating. And, and I'm not going to get into details here. Some, some of you probably know this, uh, but for those of you who don't, um, I just suggest you might want to Google, since we all do that today, uh, the name Lulu Coolis. Lulu Coolis. Now, I see I didn't get any reaction. Uh, there's a smile here. Uh, that's a female name, but I think you'd be very interested in finding out about that name uh, and the relationship between that name uh, and the founder and head of uh, IHMC. And I'm not going to say anything further. It's a very, very interesting story. It's a part of Kenya didn't, I didn't know exist, and you probably uh, didn't either, and, and I just suggest you might want to Google that. Let's see, Ken hasn't thrown me out yet, so I guess I'm safe in, the, in having mentioned that. Well, um, I, I told Ken that one thing I would not do, and I told he and his staff, what I would not do uh, this afternoon is close my eyes. 
Uh, I flew in to, um, uh, from, on a red-eye flight uh, from Los Angeles uh, last night, flew to Washington, D.C., back home, just in time to change bags, to change a few senior people, uh, perhaps not as senior as me, but a few senior people here in the room. And uh, I will tell you, I loved my Air Force career. I loved all 35 and a half years I spent in the Air Force. I loved wearing the uniform. I loved serving our country. I loved everything about it. I very proudly wore that uniform. And I would have the uniform on today if I had an opportunity to, but uh, the Air Force asked its uh, four stars uh, four-star generals to retire at 35. It's, in part, it's to allow other people to matriculate through the system, if you will, and to not hold things up. But uh, as I look in the, out and see those of you who are retired, I think most of you know that one day something happens and you know it's time to retire. Uh, I, it's, it's a little signal, a little voice or something uh, that tells you it's time to retire. And in my case, uh, it was not a little voice. It was a little voice, but it was a uh, a very prominent uh, human voice. It was my five-year-old grandson uh, who gave me the signal that it was time to retire. It was the um, end of 2002, um, uh, excuse me, actually the beginning of 2003, and um, Martin Luther King's birthday, 15th of January in Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I was in Ohio running the Air Force Material Command located in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, my son and his family, including my grandson, uh, Justin, we're in the D.C. area. My son took my grandson down to Washington, D.C. to participate in some of the Martin Luther King Day celebrations. And while he was there, my son mentioned to his son, to my grandson, that he said, do you know that your grandfather was actually here that day, uh, August 28th, 1963, when Martin Luther King had his famous uh, Freedom March? He gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Now, for those of you who are here,